All right, in this video, I'm going to show how I install DCC sound and LED lighting in an Atherin SW1000 or SW1500 ready to roll locomotive. Uh, this client has specified Tsunami 2, and they would like a Keep Alive. And so here we've got a Nix Trains Decoder Buddy motherboard, a Tsunami 2 uh, TSU21 PNEM decoder. The scale sound system speaker for the Atherin RTR SW1000 1500 locomotives, some speaker wire, a TCS KA2, and one of my LED conversion kits. Uh, this locomotive does have a rotary beacon here on top, and we'll figure out how to light that up once we get into the cab and I see exactly what we're looking at. So let's clear the parts and uh, start on our way. All right, so I like to work on the lighting first, oftentimes. So we'll just remove the shell here. And we're not gonna use any of these bulbs, so I'm just gonna nip them off. We can put the mechanism aside. Now, oftentimes you can just gently pull these bulbs out. Sometimes they're glued in a little bit more. And we can just leave that there for now, that piece of tape. So to get into the cab of these locomotives, we're going to gently pull out the handrails of the cab lift the handrails here on these corners and then when you go in you'll see a little clip right there in the front that you can release and then just release these rear clips that was our beacon light so the cab comes off just that easily Pull this gooey tape out. That stuff really sticks. Alright, so if you watched how I did the LED conversion and sound install in the ready to roll GP40X video that I made. Uh, you'll recall that usually um, I glue the lenses, my conversion lenses. So again, these lenses are are uh, sized to fit Atherin locomotives. They come in a variety of lengths. They have a nice clear look to them, and they have a nice round convex lens on the end. So you're not going to have that look of uh, 0402 LEDs in there uh, with crystal clear filling in the hole. Um, you're not you're not going to have to mess with fiber optics or or, or uh, acrylic rod or you know filing and shaping that kind of stuff. Um, this is a fast and simple way uh, to do these. But I usually attach the lens to the wire and then install the whole assembly. However, for the SW1000s and 1500s. The angle of the hood, how far up the light is, up into the hood, there's a kind of a wedge shape in the shell, and the holes are right in the, I mean, they're right up in there. There's not really any room. So what I do with these is we'll install the, the light fitting first, which it just slides in once you get it lined up. And there you can see you've got nice clear lenses on the end. Install that first and then we'll glue the LED in. And if you watched the other video, you know I like to braid my wires. So we'll demonstrate that again. Just firmly grasp the LED so that it doesn't, uh, you don't want to pull the wires off. Here's a piece of cardboard with packing tape to give it a little bit of grip. Lay the wire on, another piece of cardboard with packing tape, and 
just roll it across. <clears throat> And that right there is a very fast and clean way to braid the wiring in your locomotives. And you can go as far, you know, I usually just go to the ends. <clears throat> We're gonna trim these wires anyway. All right. Now, I'm gonna use a foam service tray here so that the locomotive stays upright. Alright, so the lens is in the front. I'm going to slide the lens into the cab. Alright, now I'm just going to use a little bit of CA to tack these in at first. Let me strip a little wire here. And truthfully, I did fail to test this, the LEDs. Um, I always test the LEDs before uh, installing them, before braiding them. Uh, and I just use, um, I've got uh, a little nine uh, little uh, AA battery holder here, and this provides three volts. And it has wires that you can just simply hold on there. So that looks good there, and we don't have anything glowing in the shell. That's important to check for. And again, I'm going to check here for shell glow. The shell's not glowing. So if we did find that a spot on the roof right here was glowing from the LED, what I do there is I've got some 10,000 uh, black styrene. I'll just cut a little piece and slide it between the shell and the, and the light fixture. Just slide it in under there underneath the LED. And that'll block out any light from glowing into the shell. So now that I know that we're good there, I'm going to go ahead and commit this with CA. And again, you know, you can use uh, crystal clear, micro micro scale crystal clear is excellent. Um, canopy glue is excellent. Uh, Um, and even, you know, like testers, clear parts, cement, or something like that would work just fine. Uh, I'm using CA uh, mainly because, well, it's fast. And um, 
And if, for whatever reason, uh, an LED needed to be replaced in the future or something, um, it, it comes apart easily enough. And so, just like that, uh, what, maybe nine minutes that I've spent here, um, I've added uh, nice lenses and LEDs in this locomotive. Now, there's a couple more steps here, just subtle little things that I like to do. I'm just going to use a little kicker to move this along. So up here, it's not such a big deal. This piece of black tape that um, I left in here from the Athern, I'll just push that back down and that'll keep light from glowing down onto the track. Uh, the cab, of course, you definitely do not want, well, you may want, you may like having the cab light up with your headlight. And if that's the case, that's fine. Um, I don't find that acceptable. So I will black blacken that light out. And just like I showed in the GP40X video, um, I used this uh, Americana Rider black, uh, black paint. Uh, you can buy this in a lot of craft stores. Um, and if not, you can order it uh, direct from Americana on their website. It's only about $3 a bottle. And one bottle will last a long time. So I'm just going to put a little bit of that down. The nozzle had gotten plugged up. and use a micro brush to just kind of uh, even it out there and uh, this stuff is very it's very thick it's very opaque that'll block out your light and it'll look good so now onto this beacon I'll just get this out of the way so we've got We've got um, a black base here and the beacon itself. Now we can shove an 0402 LED or something right up in that hole. Um, but what that'll happen is since these are uh, directional LEDs, you're only going to get at best 180 degrees of coverage. The back side is not going to light up. Um, you're only going to get one side and th that looks like uh, it's lighting up. The other, when you look at the locomotive from other perspectives, it'll be, you know, it won't, it won't be uh, lighting up. Um, now, of course, unless you've got one of those beacon kits that I forget the gentleman's name who makes that, you know, has multiple LEDs that actually go around in a circle. Those are beautiful. I've actually installed. Uh, a couple of those for clients but unless you have that we're replicating a rotary beacon with basically pulsing so I'm gonna want this beacon to light up okay so it doesn't look like the beacon itself is hollow So what I'm going to do is, this right here is also one of my lenses, and I just, I just cut it in half. So it was, a dual, it was a dual beam lens, just like this, and I just nipped it in half to get one. And I'm going to cut it, since I don't, we don't need that, uh, the concave look 
I'm just going to trim it so that it seats all the way down in there and is now butting up against the bottom of this this orange uh, beacon. Some of these are hollow and uh, this one is not hollow so this will still get the the light up into up into the uh, all the way up to the the base of this casting say so I'm curious if there is any way to just put the LED up in there and, and evenly light it let's see what this looks like well it's a little fussy this is not uh, this video is not rehearsed <laughs> and I'm doing it in real time so you're seeing how I'm experimenting with things Yeah, that's actually lighting it up evenly. I think we'll forego. Um, there have been instances where I've used these single type pieces of lens to, to reach up through and evenly light a beacon. But this one, since it's not hollow, if we just get the LED to the base of the beacon, it looks like it's uh, lighting it up just fine. So again, I'm gonna braid the wire. Part of the adding the CA all the way around the back is creating strain relief for the wire on the back of the LED. You don't want the wire pulling off of the LED, which is very easy to do with some of these delicate parts. And obviously with the CA, you don't want to get on the windows. You don't want to fog up your cab or anything like that. But just going to make sure I've got I'm just going to check that again. Oh yeah, that looks good. That's all the way around. Nice and even. Excellent. So there you go. Um, if you're mainly watching this to see how the LED conversions go, you can see that uh, it only took about 10 minutes to do the headlights so that will be blacked out there that won't shine down on the track or anything uh, this one will be blacked out and then for this beacon um, you know I'll probably just put a little bit of black paint around that hole uh, to keep the light from shining uh, the yellow light from shining down into the cab so not too bad there. All right. We'll set the cab here to dry for a little bit and the hood. So the mechanism. Um, this is uh, just how it typically looks coming out of the box. It does look like the owner may have soldered the truck wires. So the factory PCB is held on with these two screws that we're going to reuse. Just 
just set those aside. So, and this motor looks, uh, I've probably done maybe close to a dozen SW uh, RTR 1500 installs of various road names, and uh, this motor looks different than the ones that I normally uh, have seen. I don't know if this was uh, an earlier run or maybe a later run. It doesn't look aftermarket. Regardless, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check to see which ter uh, motor terminal is positive, which would give us, okay. So the left wire, positive, the left, left wire has us going forward. Hmm. Well, that truck wire just came off. That causes me to uh, have a little bit of concern about the rest of them. Let's just get some wire out of here. Alright, uh, the camera stopped recording for some reason. Anyway, these solder joints don't look too bad. What does concern me is how corroded the wire is. Um, a lot of the wire that comes on these, uh, from on you know factory locomotives, is very poor quality copper. So it's not terribly surprising. We're just going to get rid of it. Alright, so these ends are tinned. Alright, so we had that little extra step. This is really thick. This motor wire is awfully bulky. We're just going to get rid of that too. And uh, who knows how fragile it may or may not be. Better to be safe than sorry. So, the way that I designed my speaker is that the, de the decoder buddy uses this rear screw here to mount, and my speaker fits on this post and uses the other PCB um, hole to screw, and it holds that in place. So it makes it very fast, very clean. 
Let's go ahead and put the uh, decoder buddy in place. And I'm going to remove the lighting PCB. We won't need that. So we already know from our initial test that um, the left motor contact is orange. So I'm going to trim that. And it'll go in the Decoder Buddy's orange pad. One of the things that I like about the Decoder Buddy is how these motor pads are through hole. They're double sided through hole. So there's a copper pad on each side of the board and copper inside of the hole that's connecting these two pads. Um, it's very common practice in the pro audio equipment that I work on and build uh, through hole PCBs. You don't see it very often in model railroading. But uh, what I like about it in this instance is you just tend the wire and poke it up there through the bottom so now I have two tend wires poking up from the bottom apply a little heat to the pad apply a little solder And now your motor wires are in place, nice and strong and clean. They don't have to come up over top or anything like that. It's a little nifty little part of the uh, thing that I like about the decoder buddy. All right, when I do the truck wires, I stretch them over like this and I'll nip them on either side just past the 21 pin header. And what this does, and I, you know, ensure that your truck is straight when you do it. And what this does is <clears throat> it makes them the same length. And makes them just long enough. You know, it gives them plenty of uh, wiggle room for the truck to swivel and turn, but without being excessively long. Now for the front truck wires, they route through this hole in my speaker. And what that does is it keeps the truck wires and the speaker wires coming up through this hole going to the decoder buddy and it prevents the truck wires from ever getting caught up in that coupling, that universal coupling there in the drive shaft. It's not such a concern here in the back because uh, there's nothing over, over this part but with the speaker over, if the wires just ran under, under the speaker and up onto the board, there's a possibility they could sag and get caught up in that universal coupling. So what we'll do we'll install we'll solder wires here onto the speaker so I just use something like this to keep the speaker from uh, the magnet from attracting to the soldering iron. 
Um, larger sizes, you know, I can usually just lay my pinky on it and solder, but this is a rather small little box. Apparently I should be out rail fanning right now because there are a lot of trains running outside. So, <clears throat> we're going to orient, you know, you can solder the speaker wires on, you know, coming off this way. But since they're feeding up through the hole in the middle, we're going to face the wires going in. And when I solder the wires onto these speakers, I will generally favor having going just outside of the solder tabs. Um, that way we don't have any stray, stray wires uh, touching this back plate which could cause a short. All right, so we're going to feed the wires up through this hole. Like so. And we're also going to feed the truck wires up through that hole. The speaker sits right down on there. That pin locates it. Pop your screw in. Voila. You now have a speaker mounted to your ready to roll 101500. So onto these truck wires. Likewise, I'm going to go just past the lighting header. Nip. Strip. And same for the speaker wires. And they're just going to hit these front speaker terminals. <clears throat> and there you go. Pop the decoder on and the sound install is done on this uh, 1000 slash 1500. Um, it did take a little bit of extra time since I replaced all the truck wires and and clean the excess solder off those tabs and replace the motor wires. If you didn't have to replace those uh, those wires, then it would have been even faster. But uh, nice and clean and simple. Let's stick this on the uh, test track and see, make sure everything's good there. All right, so I put it on the track. Now nothing, this decoder hasn't been programmed yet, so this is still the default 567, uh, which is not the appropriate prime mover for this locomotive.
but I'm basically just testing that everything is good there. And it's great. All right, so now that we've tested this and everything's good to go on it, we'll come back to the shell. So, the lighting has already been done, but for this shell to fit on the chassis and to clear the speaker, there are some little nubs inside the shell here. I'm not sure what these nubs are for, but they're not needed. So what I do is I just grasp them with some needle nose pliers and twist them off. And that's the only, you know, modification that we'll have to make. So we can set that back aside. Actually, we don't. Um, so at this point, I'm going to explain how I install a TCS KA2 Keep Alive. Um, obviously, if you do not want a Keep Alive in your locomotive, you can skip this. But this is going to live inside the control stand and it'll be completely concealed and hidden within the cab. You won't ever know that it's there except for obviously the operational benefits of it. The issue is that it's a, it's a really tight fit and they usually will not fit in there without a slight modification. So what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to remove this control stand. It's just glued onto the base from the factory. And they usually will just kind of pop right off. Yep. Just real gentle like. There we go. And we're going to re-glue that together. So, keeping the wires down on the downside, slip the KA in there. Yeah, we're going to have to re-glue the whole thing, which is not a big deal. All right. All right, just like that. Now, I have found that reinstalling the control stand in its exact position, this little bit, this little edge right here, the KA is just enough to keep the, the cab, the, the little clip here, from snapping under the shell. So what I do is I use a piece of sandpaper and I set it down and I just file those nubs off. Just sand Get a nice smooth bottom there. And one other thing I'm going to do, I did forget to do this, is I like to, I'm actually going to do this on my lap so that it can overhang a little bit. I just wanted to braid the Keep Alive wire as well. All right, so we just apply a little CA to the bottom. Feed our wire in. And when we set it back in place, we're gonna go just behind where it was originally. Just a little.
And that right there gives us, I mean, just the tiniest amount of room so that we know that that clip on the cab will seat down into that hood. And it, it, you will never notice that the control stand is just a little bit, a little bit to the rear of the cab. I actually wasn't too thrilled with exactly how that was sitting. I'm trying to keep my head out of the camera shot. You know, we're not trying to glue the KA into the control stand, just the KA will stay in the control stand with no problems. We're just gluing we're just we only took that we only removed the control stand and took it apart. so that we could just scoot it back, you know, not even a sixteenth, maybe a sixteenth of an inch at most. That's all that it takes. All right, there we go. So coming back to our cab, um, if you remember, we added the black uh, rider's paint there on the, to keep the headlight glow from coming into the cab window. We, I do want to add a little, just a little dab of it. to the beacon. That way the cab isn't pulsing, glowing with the, uh, as the beacon works. Just fill it in. I might use just a little dab more over on this side. There we go. So that'll seal up that light hole. I don't like light going places where it shouldn't be. All right, so dressing the cab wires. <clears throat> it's fairly simple. I'm just gonna use a little piece of uh, heat shrink. And even for models that have only a rear headlight there, if there's no beacon, I still use a little piece of heat shrink around the wires inside of the cab. But especially when you've got multiple lights. So adding that heat shrink right there that runs between the windows that'll keep those wires centered and out of the window glass and this wire is just pressed up against the hood uh... the roof you know if uh... if the wires were dangling i would maybe tack them in with a little bit of glue or something like that to keep them you know up against the roof but these are staying in place and staying put i'm just going to shrink that uh tubing down that'll stay nice and put all right I'm also going to trim these wires so I've got clean ends there I think that'll be fine. And whenever I have multiple wires going anywhere, I like to harness them with bits of heat shrink. This diameter might be a little too small.
Yeah, let's just use a larger diameter. So we'll just cut off maybe four bits there. And um, you know, even though this is normally never seen, I like a clean and tidy wire management inside of my locomotives and inside of the locomotives of my clients. Um, it uh, eliminates more poss you know there's uh, it improves your your odds of not having any uh, wires getting where they shouldn't um, inside the mechanism or just keeps everything cleaner makes everything a little bit just more reliability if the shell does need to come off in the future um, say to you know replace a defective decoder or upgrade to a newer decoder version uh, doing this just makes it much cleaner and much nicer and I mean it's easier to put the shell on you're not fighting a, you're not wrestling with a nest of wires. All right, so we're going to feed these wires down. Get our flexible handrails out of the way. Snap the cab back on. And reinsert all the handrails. All right. Now we are ready to wire lighting. To the mechanism. I'll just clear some space. All right. Well, I'm going to take the decoder back off. We don't need it on while we're soldering. So I'm going to take, I'm going to keep the wires just long enough so that we can remove the shell and lay it on its side next to the, the mechanism, the chassis. If they're excessively long, it becomes more of a challenge and a mess getting everything tucked back into the shell. At the same time, we want them long enough that the shell can be separated from the chassis for maintenance. So the decoder buddy has got pads for adding a keep alive. So we'll put our positive down. and our ground. And then this is the removable lighting board. So in theory, if we weren't using a Keep Alive, the shell would completely separate from the chassis just by popping that board off and the lighting and the wires and that little lighting PCB would be a completely separate thing from the chassis. That's a very, uh, very good uh, aspect of the decoder buddy. Um, in this instance, if we did want to fully remove the shell, it would 
still be very simple. You just pop the lighting PCB and then di disconnect those uh, two wires for the decoder buddy, uh, for the Keep Alive. So it's still pretty, uh, pretty straightforward removal if required in the future. Now this fine wire uses a silicone based insulation so it doesn't melt off with a soldering iron the way uh, uh, you know like a magnet wire or something would. Alright, front headlight So there's our positive for the front headlight and the function output. Now, since these aren't color coded, we'll have to determine which black wire which cathode goes to the headlight the rear headlight and which one goes to the beacon but that's simple enough So I'll strip those two. And I just, I use these tweezers to grab the wire while I'm stripping that way. They don't pull away from me. And I'm just using a very light pressure there. My, I have very good wire strippers, but they're just a little bit too big for this very fine wire. All right, get those separated. I'm going to put the two anode positive wires, the two red wires, together. And we'll tin these up. All right. So, get the front wires out of the way. There are... <coughs> Uh, these strips along the sides of the lighting board are all positive, so we can go to either side, but since our rear headlight is right here, I'm just going to keep all of my positives on this side. Trim off the excess there.
So the only thing you've really got to watch is that you don't have any wires protruding, uh, bridging different pads. Uh, you can create a short doing that. All right, so now that the, the positive is soldered on, I can just touch this positive pad and touch this wire. Okay, so that's the beacon and yeah, that's the headlight. Just pop our beacon wire on. Let's go to aux one. And there we go. So that right there is a complete DCC sound and lighting with Keep Alive LEDs into an Athern SW1000 or 1500. So, a couple of additional, you know, closing notes or whatnot, and then we'll go look at some programming. The Decoder Buddy V5, which is what this is, the newer version, it has much longer pins, um, which is great for soundtracks, which has just a little bit of a deeper profile. These pins sticking up, I don't know if it would cause a problem with this install. Some locomotives with, with lower hoods, those excess pins right there can prevent the shell from seating all the way. So it's not at all a big deal to simply trim the excess length after the decoder is on there so you know that your pens are long enough. I'm just using little flush cutters here. Just trim those pens flush. That way you know for sure that they're not going to be pressing up against the roof of the shell, preventing it from seating all the way. Now the only, I will say, you know, caution you here. When you're trimming these pins, you want to make sure that they're discarded. You don't want a little piece of trimmed pin falling down into the decoder, bridging, you know, let, lying on the, the PCB or on this header here, uh, bridging any of these components, you know, that could, that could cause a short and then the decoder fries and you're not sure why when it was just a tiny little piece of pin that, you know, fell down on there. So, let's pop, uh, let's pop the shell on and see how she fits. There we go. Perfect. Fits like a glove. Seat and flush all the way around. There we go. Sound and LED. DCC sound and LED lighting. And an Athern RTR SW1000 slash 1500. Let's take it over to the program track and play around with it. All right, so we've got her sitting on the uh, test track. This is uh, connected with my NCE Power Cab and Decoder Pro. So coming over to Decoder Pro, everything about the decoder is default except the master volume. I took the master volume down to 75, or I took it down to 70 uh, just for safety. We can adjust it and fine tune it later, but just, you know, if it's at maximum volume, it can cause distortion with uh, the single speaker and that kind of thing. Um, so. That's the only thing that I've done. 
uh, aside, you know, outside of the default decoder settings. First thing I'm gonna do is come over here to lighting. I'm gonna switch the headlights to LED. I'm gonna switch FX3 to LED. That's where we connected our rotary beacon. I'm gonna choose rotary beacon. I want that to work in both directions. I'm leaving the headlights directional. Front light and forward, rear light and reverse. Most switchers operate with their headlights in both directions, always on, uh, but uh, prototypically. But I, I leave them directional, and if the owner, once he receives the locomotive, decides to make them non-directional, they can do that. I'm gonna write those changes. We're gonna look at our front headlight, the rear headlight, looks good. Function mapping. This is the default function mapping with Tsunami. I'm gonna disable all of the effects outputs that I'm not using. No need in keeping those. I wanna put the beacon on F5. Now F5 is already being used by manual notching, but I'm gonna move the manual notching to 25 and 26 from the default F5, F6. Write those changes. And now we can test our beacon with F5. And it doesn't matter which direction we're going, it remains functioning. All right, we'll turn the lights back off. Lighting looks good. Let's come over to sound. An SW1000 or similar would use a non-turbo 645. We're gonna choose that. And we hear it start up. Now we can choose our bell. I actually like that bell sound for this locomotive. Now horns, I kind of looked around online, I couldn't quite figure out what these Coors locomotives actually had, and it looks like they varied across the fleet, so it's a little hard for me to tell, but the model that is installed on the locomotive is some sort of three chime. And it kind of looks like a, an RS3K. But it might be a P3. Now, it's some kind of three chime. And the, the horn, the, the detail horn that's on the model might not even be uh, accurate to the prototype. That seems reasonable enough though. Again, it's very simple. The owner can change the horn to whatever horn they want. If they don't tell me what horn they want, I either will program a horn based on what's installed on the model or at least come close. <coughs> so now we come to our sound levels page. What I like to do this is just personal opinion here. Well, I definitely like to have the alarm bell a lot quieter. So we're going to turn that down. The poppet valve volume and the compressors and stuff like that, I, I find are a little bit loud relative to other things. So I'm just going to go ahead. Maybe not quite that much. We'll get close. But you hear... how we can hear in real time what's happening there. Now those radiator fans, yeah, I think the horn needs to come down. You know, and, and horns are a sensitive, uh, a hot, hot button topic for some people. For some reason, I'm not getting 
Um, some people want the horn to completely drown out the prime mover. Um, other people like it, you know, maybe toned down a little bit from there. So we're going to go with a slightly toned down version. It's still going to stand above the prime mover, but not completely drowned it out. I think uh, the air compressor and pop-up valve is roughly about right there. The radiator fans. I often find that the radiator fans will mask the sound of the prime mover. But I don't want it to go away completely. So I'm going to turn them up. that I can hear them. But they're not completely uh, drowning out the other details and, of sounds and whatnot. All these uh, other adjustments here that you can make, you know, it's really just, it really comes down to your personal preferences. over here to the equalizer. So I'm going to set it to user adjustable and write that. Those volume adjustments seem to be about right for my taste as far as the bell and the horn and the prime mover goes. I feel like it's bright enough. If we wanted it to be brighter, we could add some of this. So listen to the bell on the prime mover, and I'll boost this four kilohertz. You hear how much brighter that made that? We can maybe go just a touch. Don't need to do a lot there. I feel like we can reduce, let me turn that bell off because that'll be annoying. Let's reduce the one kilohertz. That's about right. It just clears up the sound. So here is the default. Here's with the cut down to 95. Yeah. Yeah, I like that change. Let's see what happens with 500 hertz. Yeah, I'm gonna want that down a little bit as well. Again, it just cleans up the sound, that mid-range boxy muckiness, cleans it up. Let's come down to 125. Let's see what we get. See if we can get a little more grunt. Now that's going to increase the volume of our radiators. Need to go a touch higher on that. See what happens when we crank that up. Definitely added some warmth. Let's try right around 210. And 
so as I'm making these adjustments, I'm going to listen as it revs up. I'm going to play the bell, play the horn, see how that affects things. The high pass filter, this right here eliminates low, the deep low frequencies. So as you see, if we turn it up high, you're going to hear the lower frequencies disappear. We don't want that because our speaker can reproduce the lower frequencies. So let's turn it off. And let's go to 10 and see if we hear a difference. There's very subtle change. Let's go to 15. Very subtle change. 20. Yep, that's probably about, the default setting's probably about right. Yeah, 30 was going too high for my taste. Even 10, really. cut into it a little bit too much. Let's go with 15. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing just a little bit of, a little too much of a reduction of the low end fullness at 20. So 15 is a good spot. Now coming back to our sound levels, since we've boosted some of these lower frequencies here, it's increased our radiator fan volume. So it was at 60, let's try 40. Yeah. Yeah, right about there. Again, we're just getting a hint of the radiator fan, but it's not masking. It isn't masking the, uh, the details of the prime mover or the other sounds. Yeah, that compressor I am gonna turn down a smidge because with the additional low frequencies, the thump of the compressor Little, it's a little bit overbearing at this point. I'm pretty satisfied with that. That's a pretty, uh, pretty thick, beefy little sound for this little switcher. Yeah, okay, reverb. I always go user adjustable. I don't like reverb in the exhaust. So I'm going to go user adjustable. The default is everything at zero except for horn and poppet valve, which I think are fine. I run my output level midway, my reverb gain midway, and then the horn reverb level will be to taste. Delay is also to taste. So if we go really long, and do a short horn. You can hear how long that reverb is. If we go shorter, say halfway. Now it's very, it sounds like it's reflecting off of a wall that's very close to you. Now this locomotive ran in essentially concrete canyons in the mountains. So you could justifiably use a very long reverb time like this. Oops, it started over for some reason. Given that this locomotive's home base was among large grain silos and tall manufacturing buildings in the Rockies, you could probably get away with a long reverb delay like this. I'm going to tame it back just a little. Maybe 200.
Yeah, that sounds good to me. Yeah, and that's that for reverb. So that uh, is kind of a general overview of how we've programmed the, the function outputs, the sound choices that we made, how I adjust my volume levels, how I will adjust the EQ, how I'll adjust the reverb. Let's uh, let's take her for a spin down the track and see how she is in, in practice. <laughs> 